So good day to everyone once again. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Wade Wallerstein here today at this Digital Art Observatory talk. Um, as Wade has already mentioned, um, he's a digital anthropologist, um, co-director at Transfer Gallery, and founder of Silicon Valley. Um, and today, Wade will um, hold a talk with the title of Curating the Digital. And so Wade, without further ado, I will yield the floor to you um, and we're excited to hear the talk. Oh yes, one last detail that I'll add is that we will host a Q&A session after the discussion. So please make sure that you make a note of your question and you'll get a chance to ask at the end, definitely. So without further ado, Wade, the floor is yours. Okay, just give me a second uh, while I screen share. I have a little presentation. Um, if anything goes down or you can't hear me or it's laggy, just let me know um, and we'll get going. Yeah. Okay. Uh, could you enable screen sharing, please? Yes, you should be able to share now. Great. Awesome. Okay, cool. Uh, hey, guys, welcome to my presentation on virtual phenomenology. This talk is all about curating the digital. Um, I'm really excited to be talking about this topic with the Dow Observatory and the art because in the rise of crypto, um, there are some affordances of the material that we're working with um, and some deeper considerations about what it really means to experience artwork online that I think are absolutely crucial that we pay attention to uh, in this in this in this phase. So, I mean, what is curation like we hear that word all the time online um, and in the dictionary, uh, the definition is to select, organize, and importantly, look after the items in a collection. Um, but right now, we're experiencing a little bit more of the second definition on this list, which is to select, organize, and present online merchandise, information, et cetera, using professional or expert knowledge. We hear this all the time with DJs curating use Spotify playlists and, um, you know, uh, journalists curating um, curating podcast playlists and things of the, of the sort. So during this presentation, I'm going to kind of dig through what creation has been, what it means today, and how we can take this field forward in the future. As we see today, um, uh, you know, curation has become some, a way of presenting ourselves online, particularly on social media. Um, and so there's a reason why this is important. Uh, beyond just, you know, creating interesting things for people to experience. Curation is important because real life is created through inside the collection through technologies and techniques as, of display as much as it is by the materiality of the artifacts itself. How we choose to present things and how we choose to uh, demonstrate them is, is intimately tied to how the audience will receive them. Um, and this this changes stories, this shapes narratives, and this writes the, the course of history. Um, so when we're working with curation in a digital context, this really means that we're working with digital materials within their native material context, meaning online, um, or working to translate digital native works into physical environments, which is a little bit of a different beast. We're going to talk about both. Um, Hang on just one second, you guys. I'm having a little bit of a computer issue. Hang on, um, just, uh, I'm gonna pause for just a second. Um, my apologies, everybody. Okay, cool. So as we as I was talking about, you know, from this quote from Haiti Gaysmar, real life is created inside the collection just as much as um, by the materiality of the artifacts. And that's why this is important. So what we have the opportunity to do as curators when we're working online is to engage in a rich practice of world building. Um, Michael Connor, who's the artistic director of Rhizome, recently put out um, a multi-part guide to online curating. It's totally kick-ass, um, and in the piece, he explains that online exhibitions are not just recreations of physical ones or stand-ins for a physical gallery spaces, but are full shows in their own right. They exist separate from physical space, and they can stand alone. He wrote that on the online exhibition can be more than a space of simulation, documentation, promotion, and access, um, and that the online exhibition is best understood as distinct from and connected to the embodied and situated experience of practitioners, the public, and even the gallery world. 
while online exhibitions create their own worlds, they're still situated within a larger art historical context and have real meaning for the art world. They affect how we conceive of the pieces, they affect the value of the pieces, um, and not to mention the artists and curators' lives. And this is something that we really need to pay attention to um, and give credence to uh, as we continue to develop capacities for metaverse world building. So let's keep talking about why this is important. I mean, I'm gonna keep talking about why this is important over and over and over again. Um, here is an example of uh, an image from the 2017 Whitney Biennial. Uh, it's a work by Porpentine Charity Hardscape. Um, and in this exhibition, they took her piece, which is a net art piece. It's created in hypertext um, and it's a hypertext uh, and it's a, a hypermedia adventure sci-fi story. Um, and it, is really meant to be experienced uh, on a personal desktop. But for the Biennale, they took out the work, they projected it onto the wall, and you experienced it in physical space, uh, as you can see here uh, in this image. Um, but in the gallery space, the works were flattened, they were removed, and they really didn't have the emotionally impactful experience that I had originally had when I had seen them online. And so interestingly, uh, here's, a, here's a screenshot from the game. It's called With Those We Love Alive. And as you can see, it's text-based. Um, and interestingly enough, um, in an art forum article that same year, uh, Porpentine told Don Chan that she always envisioned someone playing her hypertext games alone in their shitty apartment, on their computer in the dark, holed up and reclusive. And so once the works, was, works were removed from that native context, they were taken out of the online situation, they were flattened, uh, they lost their aura, if you will. Um, and this kind of stands in really stark contrast to this idea that's been really popular in the art world, that art is elevated in the white cube gallery space. Um, for a work like Hardscapes, taking it out and putting it into the white cube space actually takes something away. Rachel Green in the, in the year 2000 uh, summarized this when she was writing about net art for the first time in an art forum. And she said that beware that seen out of their nat native HTML, out of their network social habitats, these works or net art works are the equivalents of animals in zoos. Um, and I think this is a really interesting quote to think about 21 years later uh, after it, uh, after it it was written. Um, and it sums up a lot of the ideas that we've been dealing with so far, and really goes on to underscore the fact that the material conditions in a work of art in which a work of art exists, play a vital role in the phenomenology of the piece, in the reception of the piece, and are is something that we really need to be paying close, close attention to. Um, hang on. Okay. So let's get a little bit more complicated. Um, but what happens here when the online experience is more impactful than the offline experience, as we saw in the case of Porpentine Charity Hardscape? In his famous, uh, I want to present this quote by Seth Price. His famous piece, Dispersion, talks about the movement of images and artworks and capital through society. And this quote underscores the most crucial aspect of art in the age of mass communication. What happens when a more intimate, thoughtful, and enduring understanding comes from mediated representations of an exhibition rather than from a direct experience of it? This may seem trite and, may, and stands in contrast to the last example. Um, and of course, you know, it, it seems, it seems uh, like a no-brainer that a digital work is going to look better on a computer at home than a gallery. But what about when physical works are more imp impactful on a computer at home? I present to you the perfect example, the Mona Lisa. Um, how many people have gone to the Louvre in Paris and been totally disappointed? You expect this fabulous, beautiful image um, that looks like this, as you see here. But in reality, what you get is more like this. Uh, I have always been fascinated with her. Her images on mugs, on postcards, all over my Instagram feed. Uh, but when I went in person, it looked a little bit something like this. Um, and it wasn't the kind of mystical like moment where I look at the artwork and I just have this, this, this feeling that's indescribable. Um, we can't just say that this is digital and needs to be shown online, this is physical and it needs to be shown offline. We need to be paying attention to the circulation value of work because here, as we see with the Mona Lisa, the circulation value, the way that it's able to spread and disseminate itself through society has outweighed its exhibition value, simply what the image is uh, when, you, when you look at it. 
Um, and so the digital curator of today not only has to work with a material interface, but also within a specific circulation paradigm in order for their work to be seen properly. Um, and I mean, we see this also in the crypto world uh, with works like Beeple. Um, there, uh, many would say that the formalist qualities of his work are lacking. However, his circulation value is really high. These are images that have become ubiquitous, that have spread on social media, um, and through that have attained their value. Um, I'm going to go through. So. I'm going to go through a little bit of history now because I think it's relevant to talk about how far we've come uh, in thinking through digital curation. Um, artists are normally a little bit ahead of the curve. So in order to talk about how this is important, let me give you some background. Um, and I'm going to show a bunch of projects that have, that have developed alongside the development of contemporary digital culture because I think that they can provide some insight into how we all can think about how to organize information online. So here we have a piece by Marcel Duchamp from the 1930s, um, where he created a mobile self-contained context with an array of works in a case that exists independent of any site and exhibits seemingly freed from mu mu the museum since the artist can carry it wherever he or she goes. And here we see a clear connection to the work of the digital curator of today. It's the idea of an exhibition that's detached from an institutional setting that can stand alone, where images are pulled out of their native circulation context on Instagram or a website, they're collected, they're remediated, and they're put back into circulation as a uh, select uh, presentation. And this is really similar to how online shows are, are working today. So these ideas really developed over the next two decades with cybernetics theory in the 1940s and 60s as we started to think about the relationship between humans and computers, but I'll kind of skip through some of this because we got a little bit technical. Um, and when we really start to see the relationship between online display and uh, artwork develop is during the 50s and 60s at Bell Laboratories. This is a work by Michael Knoll where he was collaborating directly with the computer. Um, he wrote uh, just a couple years ago, looking back on this time period in his early career, that he believed that in the computer, the artist had found a new artistic partner. And so in this work, the artist has written a code and the computer has drawn lines between that code. It's based on a Gaussian quadratic formula, which is the title of this piece. Um, and in this, we see that while he has had some agency, the computer has really determined the aesthetic of how this piece is going to unfold and evolve. You can't separate the artist from the device that it was created on in this work. Um, and while Noel was experimenting with algorithmically produced art, one of his contemporaries, Lillian Schwartz, was creating dynamic animations in color. And I really see this as the, uh, I really see Lillian Schwartz's work as the, as the uh, origin point for most net art that we see today. This here was the first film that, ever, that didn't rely on pixel shifting, which is a technique that was used in which pixels are constantly changed so as to prevent burn in on a screen. Here, she's using totally analog digital techniques in order to produce these fabulous and psychedelic images. He, and in these images, you can see how the specific logic of the early computing systems that they were working with are expressed through Schwartz's collaboration with her computer, and in turn, the audiovisual interface that the computer was connected to. These images can only be produced using this particular assembly assemblage of hardware and software. These are images that had never been seen before because they couldn't have been made by a human hand. Um, and in this way, we really see how the aesthetics of the computer and the computer's vision begin to infuse daily life. Um, you know, this work was really continued in the pictures generation, uh, where folks were ripping images out of context and creating new uh, appropriate means for them. I mean, we've got Barbara Kruger here, and this is basically the first meme. Uh, but the story really begins in the 90s with net art, um, where content and community converged, and computers had the graphics capabilities to create more dynamic content. Um, here, during this era, making art, as Domenico Quaranta said, Making art with a computer no longer required technological training, access to research labs, or collaborations with engineers and professionals. Anyone could do it. And so new artistic organization began to develop as online communities formed around bulletin board systems, chat rooms, and mailing lists. These are a few of the most famous ones, uh, some of which are even around today and continue to advocate for net art, like Rhizo. Uh, interestingly, these sites were simultaneously both content and community, places where people could go to share and connect with others, but also places where people could look, where content was displayed and organized, and they could learn about new artworks. 
Um, and what made this important and what set this, you know, what kind of set this apart was that the internet seems to defy, and this is what uh, that new media curator at the Whitney, Christiana Paul, how Christiana Paul describes it, that the internet seems to defy a systematic arrangement of constituent elements. Links make it possible to connect text and visuals to the contextual network in which they are embedded and to visualize a network of references that would normally be separated by physical space. And that's really what we started to begin to deal with in the 90s after those early experience, the experiments by Michael Knoll and Lillian Schwartz at Bell Labs. Uh, in the in the uh, in the mid 20th century here's another example of a net art work where content and community comes together this is from cameron's world which is a piece of net art um, by cameron askin where he compiled a whole collage of different geocities pages together they form a composition but you can click through each one and go to an individual page where a whole world can unfold in front of you and notably you know as christiana paul mentioned the most important aspect of this work is their networked quality, their embeddedness into the social fabric of the internet. Um, and we're going to see this kind of unfold and develop uh, as we kind of keep going in the history. This We saw this continue with the surf clubs in the early 2000s, which were more blog based. Um, and where the uh, where the act of surfing the web, where the act of moving through information, of collecting material, was kind of considered like a spiritual artistic praxis. Um, the the act of surfing the web was seen as a creative outlet um, and a way of and a really important mode of of being. Um, and interest, and you know, the surf clubs are really important because, as CC Moss put it, searching searching was equivalent to making a form of craft, and that really speaks to what digital curation means today. The digital curator of today uh, must search through the massive deluge of information, the vast quantity of material that's online, and make meaning. Um, and that's really the key here. Um, as Jesse Darling put it, social media is to the read-write web what sprawl is to the metropolis of modernity, a homogenous, cancerous, rhizomatic jug space that expands exponentially outward on a sludgy wave of strip malls and sponsored links, greed, and induced demand. Um, and this is the context that digital curators are working in today. Uh, we're in this sprawling junkyard, and we need to make meaning out of the chaos. So with a little bit of history out of the way, I'd like to make some uh, I'd like to make some theoretical considerations um, that I think are important uh, for us to consider as we move into some examples of digital curation from the recent era. Um, and the first, you know, this all starts out with Marcel uh, with Marcel Mauss's and Jean, uh, body techniques and Jean Paul Warnier's praxeological approach to subjectivation in a material world. Um, and according to Marcel Mauss's body techniques, all techniques of the bodies in involve motricity are socially determined and have to be analyzed in a holistic way that incorporates both the biological, the psychological, and the sociological. Um, the knowledge that we have about the world is inscribed in physical techniques of the body. Um, and this is important to take into consideration as we're clicking through web pages, looking at shows, what are our eyes doing? How are we sitting? How are our hands moving and clicking and actually uh, engaging with the material? Um, as Mouse put it, there is no technique of the body that does not incorporate a given materiality. And so when we're thinking about the digital, we have to think about the specific body techniques that are employed in order to engage with that material. Um, we also, another important consideration is a praxeological approach, which uh, praxeology is a really big word, but it really just means the study of human action, because how we move through the world determines how we understand it. Um, and this approach brings together motricity, perception, agency, material culture, the subject, our unconscious biases, um, and even large societal power systems. And it and praxeology really seeks to understand how all of these things come, to come together to determine how we move. But all of that complicatedness aside, uh, the big picture a message is that we experience the world by moving through it. By being in the world, that's how we know what's going on. Um, and so by creating immersive online environments, by working with the affordance of digital material, we create deep and rich and meaningful experiences for viewers. Um, 
we could talk about Foucault because, you know, we can't really get through any kind of presentation without talking about Foucault. Um, <laughs> but um, he really talked about uh, techniques of the self in his writing. And that's something that digital curators um, often are working on employing. Um, the subject is, for any online uh, exhibition um, uh, is, is working within a space of power that's defined by the curator. And, this is something that the curator has to take into consideration. They have to work on subjectifying the viewer. The viewer has to understand this or collapse the space between themselves and what they're looking at and the material. Um, and through developing techniques of the self by working with the ways in which people can come to define themselves and come to understand the world around them, again, we can create richer phenomenological experiences. Um, and so that comes, that brings me to, you know, the title of the presentation, Phenomenology, um, which is really the kind of key entry point that I want to bring to you today. Um, in his 1994 book, A Phenomenology of Landscape, Chris Tilly explained how a phenomenological approach to thinking about landscapes is vital to understand how people exist in the world and in space. Phenomenology is a study that reinscribes in space the relationship between the human body, agency, temporality and social production, um, which is a perspective culminating in the understanding and description of things as they are experienced by the subject. In short, it is about the relationship between being and being in the world. And in examining these digital curatorial projects, a phenomenological perspective helps us to understand how these projects appear to us, make us feel, and how we experience them as visual and material uh, artifacts of our world that we can only experience through our bodies. Um, phenomenology is the manner in which people, again, as I said, you know, just a little bit more depth. Uh, it's, phenomenology is the manner in which people experience and understand the world. Um, and it's, it's really, you know, the first person subjective experience as they receive it. Um, and being in the world is really is uh, com comprised of a process of objectification. That's really how this works. People need to objectify the world by setting themselves apart from it. It's the distance between me and what I see on screen. Um, and to be human is both to create this distance between the self and what is beyond, while also attempting to bridge this distance. And that bridging is where the digital curator comes into play. There are a lot of different ways that we do this. It's through our perception, through our movement, through our intentionality, our emotion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we experience places on multiple different levels at one time and in our brain sort through these different levels to create that distance, which ultimately creates meaning for us. Um, as you know, there's personal space, community space, regional space, political space, imagined space, and all of these kinds of spaces collapse together in our minds. Digital curators have to create this space and they have to work within these different uh, conceptualizations of the audience in order to create an exhibition uh, environment that taps into how the viewer is going to activate it. So that, and ultimately what phenomenology brings us to is this big question, which is what does the metaverse feel like? That's what cur digital creation is all about. It's giving somebody a feeling, bringing them into the world, working with this idea of subjectivation, working with this idea of distance between the viewer and what they're viewing and really uh, engaging that in a meaningful way to tap into people's feelings and to tap into what they, uh, what they uh, have been going on in their internal internal lives. Um, for instance, take a look at this. These are um, a series of works from a, a personal project of mine. It's called the same title, Virtual Phenomenology, where I've used ethnographic practice, uh, ethnographic uh, methods to visit different virtual worlds and record what it feels like to be there. Um, this is a view from a forest floor in the rain. Um, and staring at this looping video gives you a sense of what it's like to be in this wet, watery, and forested world. Here's another example um, from the same series of virtual phenomenology where, you, the, where the video really helps us to understand what it's like to be standing in this virtual forest, uh, to feel the wind blowing on our faces as the mist rolls in over the pond. Um, it's fall and the air is crisp and the leaves are swirling around. Um, and 
we, and again, through this project, I aim to give these small windows of moments into the virtual so that we can better understand the phenomenology, the phenomenology of what it means to be there and why it's important. Um, this is another work in the series uh, that represents a virtual downtown San Francisco. Um, and here we have again, um, another, uh, another view of, of, of San Francisco, of the Bay, the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. I love, I love finding virtual representations of San Francisco because that's the city uh, where I'm from. Um, and as you look at this, you know, really think about how this makes you feel. Does this look like a, the real thing? Are you fooled by the simulation? Um, do you wanna go there? Um, and what kind of emotion are you feeling as you look at this kind of dusky sunset over the foggy water? Um, I, I, uh, I work to install these, these pieces together in virtual environments in a kind of uh, cacophonic um, methodology, because when we're online, we have such a, a bombardment of information. And when we, and, you know, as any gamer knows, uh, virtual worlds are fast paced, constantly shifting and fragmented. And the installation of this piece aims to replicate that. Um, so as we've seen, you know, there, the virtual is a discrete material place that makes us feel a certain way. Um, and what we need to, what's really important to really drive home in all of this is that both the online and the offline are real. There, it's not, it's kind of a misnomer and it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a fallacy to say the on the, the, the IRL versus the URL or the online versus the real. Uh, the online is just as real as the offline um, and real life happens in both places as much as we might like to think that it doesn't. The virtual and the actual, as Tom Bellsdorf put it, are not reducible to each other, even in their mutual constitution. So while the online world affects the offline world, they're both separate and discrete material places where things can happen and people can have agency. Um, and they, and um, as I mentioned earlier, we need about treating the digital materials within their own native context. It's important to be cognizant of the boundaries between these spaces, even when they can seem to blur. So if we're talking about digital material and treating digital material on its own terms, there are a few things that we need to keep in mind. The first is the digital worlds are no more or less material than the worlds that preceded them. Um, there's this misconception that the digital is immaterial, and that's not really the case. Uh, digital material is made out of zeros and ones and electronic impulses, fiber optic cables, uh, network protocols, software interfaces, hardware interfaces, monitors and pixels. Um, there, it's a different kind of materiality, but it's material nonetheless. And to really drive the point home, digital information cannot exist without the physical devices that manipulate, store, and exchange them. Computing systems are utterly suffused through and through with the constraints of their materiality. Um, and we've known that and, uh, <laughs> anybody who has ever experienced a power outage uh, knows this uh, very intimately. Um, finally, uh, and this is the key here, the logic of a computer can be expected to significantly influence the cultural logic of media. We saw that with Lillian Schwartz and her early experiments in the 60s, that the way that her computer was able to, to create images uh, influenced the cultural logic of those images. These are computer made images. And the way that we look, the way that we understand those aesthetics, those kinds of virtualized aesthetics that can only be made with a computer screen that look something like this. Um, we, you know, we need to pay attention to what those visual effects are, to what those aesthetics mean, to how that logic is changing us. Um, so in accordance with that, the hardware that supports a digital object plays a role in how it performs and ultimately determines how we understand it. So I could go on and on about some definitions of digital material, or um, I'll share the presentation afterwards, uh, uh, for you to talk about, uh, for you to take a look at if anybody's curious. But for now, um, I'm going to skip through a little bit. Um, and I want to show you some examples of how, how different practitioners have used different techniques of digital curation in order to create really meaningful experiences. This is a project called Is This It, run by a good friend of mine, Bob Bicknell-Knight. Um, you can find them on Instagram at is this it, is, um, is this it. 
Um, and it's an online exhibition space that's been around since 2016. Um, and this is one of my favorite shows uh, that, uh, this is one of my favorite shows uh, from the, um, excuse me, sorry, uh, from their history, uh, including work uh, by Ava Papa Margariti, uh, among others. Uh, and you can see here, this is a zoomed out screenshot of a web page uh, where, where the videos and the text messages have been taken out of circulation and recombined in this graphical display. Now, this is a really simple way of creating an exhibition, but really effective in terms of how it's able to impact the viewer. This is, these are some more examples from Is This It, where you can really see how the aesthetic of net art, how the aesthetic of blogs and tumblers and different web environments um, has created really unique kinds of display that mimics uh, popular contemporary internet subcultures. This is an exhibition that I curated uh, for Is This It a few years ago. It's called A Form You Can Understand. And I was working with digital avatar artists or artists who only identify by their online identities. Um, this is work by Gazira Babeli. Um, and as you can see here, I try to use the really simple techniques and tools um, available to me via this web host platforms. Um, uh, you know, applications to create an immersive experience without doing anything too complicated. And this is all to say that it doesn't require uh, a vast knowledge of code in order to make a really engaging and meaningful uh, interaction with digital content. There are really simple ways that we can add tactility, that we can add motion, and that we can add dimension in order to make this work kind of leap off of screen and feel really present for us. And to make that screen-based experience something that is, doesn't just feel like a a passive but a, actually a really active experience. Um, another way that I did this is through creating interactive galleries of still image photographic works. As you can see here, the images are displayed and the viewer can click and move them around, creating a personal relationship with them. Um, how many times do you go to an art gallery and you are not allowed to touch the work uh, that's on display? That's not the case when we're working online. Um, this is another fabulous, uh, uh, a fabulous exhibition at Offsite Project, uh, where the, it's, it's called um, Screensaver Watching You, and they created a ghostly version of an early Windows screensaver on, uh, as the exhibition to host it. And as you see, you can click through the different icons um, and view the different pages of the show. And so again, they're both, they're using the interface of the computer. They're using the native environment that digital material comes from, from the desktop to be the exhibition environment for the work. Um, and ultimately comment on how the frame of that interface affects our cognition and affects our understanding of this material. This is another exhibition um, at uh, Offsite Project that I co-curated for the Wrong Biennale. It's called Too Beautiful to Be Real. And this exhibition really works to use the uh, HTML web environment to explore how images in digital culture uh, can be, uh, have affected the way that we think about beauty and affected how we understand what is real and what is not real. Um, these are some videos from the exhibition uh, where we've tried to install them in a way where the boundary between what's physical, between what's virtual, between what's interface and what's exhibition content is totally blurred. Um, and you see that in these videos, uh, these video tours where I'm scrolling through the show and it's hard to tell where one work starts and another one ends. Uh, this part here is actually uh, an amalgamation of a number of different works together that have been collaged so that you can't really see the boundaries between them very well. Um, here's another example uh, from that same exhibition uh, with works from Chiari Ribo, Alice Bucknell, uh, Ava Papa Margariti, Kakia Constant uh, and Faith Holland. Um, this is an exhibition that I curated as well for Offsite Project called The Finder, where again I try to utilize the uh, the desktop interface and really explore how living through the desktop, anyone with a digital studio practice, any kind of artist today basically lives in their desktop to really understand how the structure and the format of our desktop is affecting our creative production as artists and curators and creatives. 
Um, this is a work by Katya Konstantinaki where she took the desktop and she animated over it, uh, creating this kind of hyper real and confusing, um, but also multi-layered depiction of her desktop in a virtual studio. Um, here we see the different spaces of the digital collapsing, uh, the imagined space, the virtual space, the desktop space, the workspace, the personal space, the life space, it's all kind of coming together here in this kind of fantastical and abstract composition. Um, and I think that this is a great metaphor for how our digital faces impact us um, and also demonstrates how this show aimed to really utilize that architecture to make a point. Here's another example of a great show by, uh, by Feldstein. Uh, they put these together, these wonderful online shows that are really simple and straightforward with images. You can click and tap and drag the images around. And again, as, I, as we saw in the, the, sh in the um, show that I, I mentioned just a few minutes ago, this tactility really facilitates the connection with the virtual artwork. Um, here's a, here is an online exhibition put on by Cluster Duck Collective. Um, just another example of a spatialized immersive experience that changes our relationship to, to the work. Um, um, which brings me to, you know what guys, I'm, I'm going a little bit out of order today, um, but that's okay because we like to switch things up a little bit. Um, but something else that's really important to take into consideration as we're thinking about native environments, uh, this is a web environment. These are obviously web environments and desktop environments. Um, but as we're thinking about native environments, what about game worlds? Um, and so this is a really wonderful project uh, by Drew Nikonowicz, who's based in Illinois. It's called Localhost, um, and the gallery runs entirely on Minecraft. And for each exhibition, uh, the, the curator rebuilds a new gallery that's custom for each work in the show. Um, these are some more stills from local host gallery uh, taken directly from Minecraft. Um, and there's something really to be said in digital curation about going to where the people are. And I think that this is one of the most underutilized and undervalued aspects um, of the virtual world that curators and the fine art world at large have yet to tap into. I want to present to you this project by Laturbo Avedon. It's called Your Project, Your Progress Will Be Saved, and it was part of the Manchester International Festival uh, in 2020. And essentially, uh, Manchester International Festival created space inside of Fortnite uh, for artists to create their own worlds. And so this is Laturbo's world. It's called Your Progress Will Be Saved, and it's all within the massively multiplayer uh, uh, Fortnite creative mode sandbox world builder. I'm going to share a short video, uh, you know, a playthrough from the world that I, I took uh, as I'm just talking about it. Um, but this work was amazing because not only did it utilize the affordances of a virtual world, one that millions and millions of players are familiar with and native to, um, Fortnite has, uh, I think, something like forget maybe four or five million players and a two billion dollar digital object economy. Um, this particular exhibition was visited over two million times by discrete viewers. Rather than going to a traditional contemporary fine art market, the artists decided to go to where the people are and the people are playing video games. Something like uh, over 50% of adults in the United States alone identify as gamers or say that they play games. This is a visual aesthetic. This is a virtual logic that people are now native to and that most people are familiar with. We need to go to where the people are, like Fortnite, and create experiences that speak to them in their native languages. I could never curate a show that was seen by 2 million people. No matter what museum I was working with, no matter how much press I got, it's just not physically feasibly possible to get that many people through a physical space. But in Fortnite, there's no limit. Um, and so many people who aren't, uh, in, who aren't, um, what's the word, um, who aren't a part of the art world, who haven't been kind of invited to that exclusive set or don't have specialist knowledge, were able to go here and experience it. Kids, gamers, people who don't know anything about art, uh, about the art world or art history, were able to have a really rich and meaningful experience presented for them in their native environmental world. Um, and 
I'm gonna, you know, I think I'm running out of time and I wanna leave some time for Q&A, but I wanna show just one more project or two more projects that I think really demonstrate uh, these ideas. Um, and this is a gallery called AVD XYZ. Um, AVD is now defunct. They've changed names and are now called obsolete. Um, and at the time, back in 2018, AVD Codes was a mobile only gallery, meaning that their site did not work if you loaded it on a desktop computer, but you had to run it on your phone. Um, it was developed by web designers Toby Seymour and Lachlan Kosanek Innes, um, and it aimed to give the viewer a more intimate experience by presenting the work on mobile rather than on desktop. Um, and so here are some screenshots of the, sorry, I'm just getting some messages. Um, here are some screenshots from the gallery while it was open. It's now defunct. I wish I could show you like a proper virtual tour, but these are just some stills of the mobile interface. Um, I, um, and basically, uh, it's, oh gosh, it's so hard to see without video, but you can see how they've developed a structure that works, particularly in the vertical mobile format where augmented reality is possible and you can move around and experience the show with your body. Um, and as Seymour and Kosanik Innes explained to me when I interviewed them, the works in our shows embody the device and therefore the device becomes a part of the work. This means that we can create a digital piece that can be handled and interacted with by the viewer. That interaction is personal and it's cool to be within that space between the user and their device. We feel that mobile presents a different kind of engagement between the viewer and the artwork. For example, rather than walking around a gallery, the user manipulates the space around their viewpoint. Ironically, that can allow for a more physical interaction than with a physical work. And with this gallery, you can swipe, click, download, touch, and move the works on display with your body, which gives you a physical ex and, and again, embodied experience of the work. This goes back to what I was talking about with subjectivation, praxeology, and body techniques. We experience the world through our bodies. We know the world through our bodies. And in turn, we know ourselves through our bodies. When we can activate those potentials, we can create deeper, more meaningful experiences. Um, the final, ex the final example that I want to show you today, um, and you can open up your phones at home and check this out right now. And I encourage you all to do so. It's a little bit of an interactive portion. Um, this is called exhibit on scroll. Um, and it was created by Kurt Viart and Christina Olek. Um, and it's an exhibition that takes place entirely on Instagram. And so what you do is you can go to at exhibit underscore on scroll on your phone on Instagram, which is now a back online. I know yesterday was tough for some of us. Um, and you turn your phone sideways and you swipe through horizontally instead of vertically, such as this. Um, and this is really fascinating. This is maybe my all time favorite exhibition ever. Um, it's not only because it's based entirely on social media, but it totally subverts the norms of the platform, as well as the normalization of the body techniques that we employ to use that platform. We're so used to scrolling up and down. Um, and this show adds friction and adds something different. They have to actually physically turn the phone sideways and use a different kind of motricity in order to move through. Um, this exhibition shows how tactility is crucial to digital art experience um, and also critiques the fact that as devices become more invisible, the physical gestures become more routine. And by switching that up, we create this kind of brand new phenomenology that feels really alien. Um, the a traditional relationship between the user and the interface is upended and the artist reclaims control over the experience of their work back from the platform and from the hardware developers. You have to really reconsider here how your body relates to the content on screen. Once unconscious movements are suddenly awkward and you're holding an alien device in your hands. Um, oh my gosh, I totally went over my time, but I think that that's a great place to Start, stop and have some conversation. I've got tons more uh, digital curatorial examples that I can share with folks of um, excellence that has been going on lately. For instance, this is an example from CTM Festival this year of an immersive virtual ex exhibition where unique avatars and fantastic environments uh, were created. Um, here's another example, uh, Digital Artist Residency, which is a UK-based program. Um, 
blah, 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 more information. This is an online exhibition that I curated for Transfer Gallery called Pieces of Me. Here on screen, we have work by, by Rick Silva. Um, and here uh, is an example of an exhibition in crypto space that was uh, curated in 3D on New Art City. Um, so yeah, I think I think I think with that uh, I will stop there. Um, thank you guys so much for uh, coming to the presentation, um, and I'd love to you know take take any questions if if anybody's got them.